in the barren wastelands, the only thing crueler than nature is the cruelty of man. A warlord's rule is absolute. Until his most trusted warrior walked away. Now a hired killer has become a wanted man. And to save himself, he must protect those he once hunted. My name is Stuart Brown. I'm the Head of Program and Acquisitions for the BFI. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I hope that you're all keeping safe and well and being cool to one another. Um, so this evening's event is a celebration of the extraordinary career and talents of the actor Rafan Khan. When I saw the news a couple of weeks ago that he'd passed away, I felt a sense of shock and then uh, a kind of sense of loss. And I immediately thought of my friend and a good friend to the BFI, um, the director, Asif Kapadia. Um, Asif and I got talking and we decided that we'd put together this event tonight and we'd uh, take a look at his debut feature, The Warrior. Uh, the Warrior is up on BFI Player now, so I do hope that everyone's had a chance to see it. If you haven't, don't worry, it's going to still be there. So you can go to BFI Player after this and watch The Warrior. Obviously, it comes highly recommended. Um, I'm very pleased to say that we're going to be joined this evening by the cinematographer on the film. Uh, Roman Osin. Roman has some technical issues this evening, so he'll just be with us via audio, uh, but we'll bring him into the chat um, after a couple of questions. And you guys have got a chance to ask a question as well. Uh, if you put your questions into the chat function on YouTube, um, Asif and I will get to them at the end of our conversation. So without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming Asif Kapadia. Hi there. Hey, Dean Stewart. Hey, Roman. Good to, um, good to be here. Uh, not the uh, the best reason in a way to be doing this but also I guess when you have the luck of working with an amazing artist like Irfan Khan I guess what you're left with is the work and the art and uh, I suppose it's an interesting time to revisit my beginning kind of as a filmmaker my first feature um, but also for Irfan it was like really the a point of a, his career when he was thinking of quitting acting and we were luckily kind of came into one of each other's orbit and we were able to work together and had this amazing experience. And then he went on to become this, you know, this megastar. So, Asif, before we um, get properly into talking about Erfan and your relationship with him and the process of making uh, The Warrior, I thought I'd ask you to tell us um, something about the genesis of the film, um, like, where were you at in your life in the early 2000s? Um, and how did you get such an ambitious debut feature off the ground? Because it really is remarkable in the, the sheer ambition of it when you watch it again now, it's, it's, it's breathtaking. And it's really, I mean, it's really strange, isn't it? Just a few months ago feels like another lifetime. So to kind of go back to 20 years ago, um, I think The Warrior started um, maybe 1998, 1999, uh, with um, a conversation with my co-writer Tim Miller um, and we were both fans uh, it, when I was I had just graduated from the Royal College of Arts I was fresh out of film school I had made a student film The Sheep Thief which Roman shot um, in India and most of the crew actually on The Warrior had done The Sheep Thief um, the composer Daria Marinelli um, a lot of the, the sound crew Andy Shelley a lot of the team were from the Royal College of Art or connected in some way to that film so, so I was trying to figure out what to do as a first feature. You know, there was a sensible London film set in Hackney, which is my kind of version of do the right thing that I was trying to write. Um, but I could never crack the script. And then there was this mad idea, which was, why not just do a samurai film and a Western, but set it in India with no dialogue, with like horses and next, you know, burning down villages. I mean, it was just like the crazy one. And the thing is, everyone liked the crazy one. 
and it seemed easier to get the crazy idea, which everyone had said initially, that's your third film, not your first film, um, going. And, I, and I, for me, it was making, being very young, naive, skinny, and very driven, and wanting to make pure cinema the kind of movies I went to the cinema to watch, the films that I would come to the BFI to watch, inspired by Leone, Sergio Leone, inspired by Kurosawa. So, you know, it was the naivety of thinking, why don't I just do a samurai film? Because I like them. As you get older, that gets knocked out of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are you crazy? <laughs> no one's going to let you do that. But when you're young and stupid, you're like, yeah, of course I can do that. I can do that. I've never been to Japan, didn't know anything about it, you know, but it was like that is what set it off. It was just a dream and looking at the window. And at the time I was in Kentish town in a flat, it was pissing down with rain. I'm like, do I really want to shoot a movie here? Exterior desert day. You know, that's how it started. It was like, I want to go and shoot a film in the desert with horses. And so that, that's really where it came about. And Tim Miller and I worked on it. And then we met Bertrand, the producer. And, and that was it. it. There were a group of people who were willing to dream. And, and how, um, from, obviously, you, you must have got the finance together and got the green light. But um, can you tell us a bit about going to find the locations and, and, and all of that kind of... Um, because really, really, you, you do like to challenge yourself as a filmmaker. <laughs> I mean, I, it, I know it, it was, wasn't it was, easy. Yeah, it was not easy. And it was, it was because I guess at the time, you know, I wasn't married. I didn't have a mortgage. There was all the kind of stuff that comes with age and maturity and settling down. We were, I, I was still a student, I felt like, you know. And so a lot of it was just done with the producer would sort of like say, okay, here's a little bit of money. And I'd go off to India on my own initially and hooked up with Amit Kumar, who was our kind of collaborator who I'd worked with on the Sheep Tooth as well. And he's been a kind of good friend and a collaborator many times over the years. And we went off and we literally would hire a car and we'd go off and look for locations and we'd head off into the desert. And there's a war going on between India and Pakistan and we'd drive through the middle of it going, this looks like a nice bit of desert, you know military that tanks people with guns military police everywhere there's a war going on india had just set off a nuclear bomb and i remember looking on a map um this is like really kind of pre-internet and everything it was just starting out and looking on a map in india anyway and uh and go doing a rough circle around pokhoran and saying let's not go there because they just set off a bomb you know, uh, but everywhere else is up for grabs i mean it was insane we found this amazing fort which was crumbling, which supposedly was cursed. And no one had been in for 25 years. And we go in and go, we'll use it. Um, and the, you know, the idea of starting a film in the desert and just saying on paper in Kentish town, and the film ends in the Himalayas. <laughs> and the character's gonna walk from here to there. And it was just, a, it was a kind of fairy tale, I guess. That was the idea. It was a slightly magical, mystical, spiritual tale of non-violence. And um, that, yeah, that was it. The locations, I'd go off, find locations, come back, um, and I would then um, re rewrite, a, do a new draft of the script and then go off to India again and do a new draft. And then in the middle, start looking for actors before the main unit had started. And that's how it came about. A lot of it we did ourselves until the team came along. And um, the, the story itself, the, the samurai-esque kind of tale, I guess it's a kind of a redemption tale. And, and as you say, a sort of uh, some kind of... Um, moralistic story of non-violence or, or where, where did the, the the narrative come from where did the story come from so initially um as i said i started writing with uh, tim miller who was one of my tutors at the royal college of art and tim um and i lo loved japanese stories and he far more well read than i was um and he had mentioned the book of japanese folk tales and in this book of japanese stories there was this footnote and it was a, a three or four lines of um story of a young kid being shown a severed head and asked is this your father and the kid knows it's not his father but to save his father's life lied and said yes it is and then in true Japanese tradition because of whatever the father had done that was so dishonorable committed suicide got his sword and killed himself so that footnote was where the kind of germ of the whole screenplay and the whole idea of it gave us a genre it gave us a a young boy and a father, somebody's looking for the father, but it's not the father, so who's the dead guy? You know, all of these questions were really where the screenplay grew out of. And, uh, and, the, and the main thing that Tim and I tried to do was to write it like a, a Leone film, a film told through images, told through pictures, very little dialogue, 
I think in a 90 page screenplay, there were seven pages, if you added it up, seven pages of dialogue. So the story was all gonna be told with the imagery, the locations, the camera movement, and in the cut. And we needed an actor, we needed a central character to carry it. So it was like this dream thing of writing a Leone type script or idea or a Kurosawa film, but searching, not having any idea whether you'll ever find your Mifuni or your kind of Clint Eastwood or, you know, how are we going to do it unless we can find the actor? But that brings us very nicely into my uh, next question, actually, um, because it's almost like we just it. like, ju yeah, almost <laughs> just like Mifuni or, or Eastwood, you did you did find the actor, um, yeah, and and just like the the films of Kurosawa and, and Leone, much of your film is in the eyes, right? A lot of it is told through the eyes of whichever character, but especially. Fan Khan's. Yeah. Um, could could you say something a bit, a little bit about the casting process? How did how did you cast not not just Erfan but all, all of the characters? So um, I always knew because the, the sheep thief, the previous film, the student film, um, was made with with non professional actors, and at that point particularly, I was really interested in whoops, action cut there, interested in the uh, um, the kind of naturalism and an almost a Bresson style way of, of telling stories or a, a Lochian way of telling the story. And so um, I knew in this case, I'm going to need probably a professional actor, but I'm going to mix it up with non-professional. So where, whereas we were looking for an actor to carry the role, um, the street kid who he meets along the way, we did actually look for street kids and that's who we worked with. That's who we found. The, the boy Nora was like, had been living on a train station platform for years. Um, but we needed to team him up with someone really experienced. Um, and so I met a lot of actors and, and you've got to realize we're going back to another time. At that moment in time in the late nineties, the idea of a British film being made, not in English with no British actors going to India to shoot it entirely. Like there's no white guy to come and save the day, right? That wasn't that kind of film. It wasn't like, how can we somehow make this about British or, or the UK? It was a British movie made with a UK crew who were all international, but shot entirely on location and in Hindi and with all of the actors from over there. Just not done. Um, and, and then after that, it was like going to India to realise, ah, I want to shoot in the desert and in, and in the, the mountains. We're going to a country which has got the biggest film industry in the world, right? They make more movies than Hollywood and everyone else. None of the actors were really interested. They could give a toss. They're like, what? Who's the star? Who's going to be, you know, who's, who's doing the songs? Who would, what, what kind of, yeah, yeah. who's the choreographer? It's not a kind of movie. So the kind of genre that we were trying to do, nobody got it. So the actors literally, there were no out of work actors in Bombay. They were all jumping from one movie to another. So they would say, look, if you want me to do this movie, I've got two days in October and maybe three in next November. And basically, because what they do is they just shoot in Bombay and they go from one studio to the next. That's yeah. how it was. The idea of even shooting an entire film in one go was not normal there. You shot 10 films at a time. And that's obviously not how we make movies. So the whole concept, they didn't understand what I was talking about. I didn't understand what they were talking about. When I tried to describe the film, <laughs> they thought I was an idiot. There's no, you know, because no one reads a script. It's like, tell me the story. So you tell them the story yeah. and you could see them falling asleep while I was trying to do it. But it just wasn't working. And that's where Irfan comes in. Irfan walks in the room. We're in a, it's during the monsoon. It's pissing down with rain outside. The palm trees are like 90 degrees. He comes in. This face, this amazing face, his amazing eyes, this tall, elegant man sits down and like straight away, we're like, this guy's it. He's got something. He had that presence. And then... We worked together, he understood the references, he loved world cinema, he watched the movies, he knew where we were coming from. Later on, he then told me that he was thinking of quitting acting. Because of the way he looked, no one would cast him. He could never get a leading role. He was never gonna be, he didn't have chocolate box looks, which is what they wanted in Bollywood right, at right. the time, right? The reason we cast him was exactly because of the way he looked, because of the yeah, weight yeah. he seemed to carry, because of the, yeah. almost the sadness that he had in his eyes was what we needed. And, and as you know, from the first shot of the film, we make a point and make a virtue of his eyes and his face. Yeah. Everything that everyone else said, that's the problem. We were like, but that's why we love you. And it, and it was just a, a really, really great experience. He was fantastic. He's very clever, very intelligent, very technical, understood everything, and then found a way to take every sentence in the script and just would elevate it with the process, the way he would 
explain what was going on in his head with just a look of the eyes and a movement and you know really brilliant he he was so brilliant and technical and so just elevated everything and and it was a joy a joy to work with him and and he um my understanding is that you shot the film fairly chronologically so you, you started in the desert and then moved to the mountains and yeah if you look at his performance and his character without saying many words he manages to convey this he is the top dog warrior he is the you know he, he carries real weight and gravity in that presence and then you see him when he eschews violence and he doesn't you know when he when he moved to the mountains and he's specifically not uh doing that anymore you understand a lot a lot of that from him as well and um I wonder, did, did you do lots of choreography and body language, or was it just a very kind of um, instinctive performance on his part? We did spend quite a bit of time kind of, we didn't have lots of classical rehearsal, but we did rehearse. And there was a lot of understanding, kind of less is more was the refrain for this film, all the way through with everything, camera, the kind of design, the costumes, the hair, everything. There was, we wanted it to feel naturalistic, we, but it was always like stripping away and saying, how can we do this in a, in a minimalist way? And, and I do think the kind of Bresson, uh, A Man Escaped was a particular favourite of mine and trying to think of that as a, as a kind of reference of how little can you do and make it powerful rather than doing more and more and more and more cuts. Um, and this is an old school film, man. This was shot on Super 35, um, all on film it was we literally had a print this is like the movie that was a crossover almost pre-digital we had video assists at the beginning they all blew up or exploded in a desert and so most of the time we had no video assists we had we were off the grid no cat no no phones and things like that no internet on set you know so you just would shoot and you'd watch the actors and you'd look at your cameraman and you look at your focus pillar and say did we get it and he goes yeah it looked good and i you know you might get another take where you go like just do a subtle thing here and then you just do it and it felt good, you move on. Nothing, nothing on playback. It, the Russians would get sent back to England and processed, I think. And then we would get a, a fax from the editor, Eve, in London <laughs> saying, looking good. <laughs> you know, that, that, wow. maybe for wow. scene 32, you could think about a cutaway and that would be it. It was like old fashioned, shiny fax paper. And that, no executives on set, no producers on set, really. It was, it was, a, it was an interesting time. It was a great time. And, and yeah. I don't know if Roman wants to say something about the technical aspects was, of when I was just he was say, we, I think we've got a clip of uh, Erfan's acting. Should we play that first and then, and then we'll bring yeah. Roman in and we'll, we'll ask Roman uh, about okay. the experience of working with Erfan. So um, can we cut to the first clip, please, guys? We're going to bring Roman in, the cinematographer now. Um, and again, Roman, uh, before we talk about the more general experience of um, working on a film, I, I specifically want to talk. Oh, Asif is very kind of showing us a picture of Roman because we have no video. Um, <laughs> I really want to ask you about the. <laughs> Don't make me laugh. <laughs> it shakes. <laughs> if only I still had that much hair. <laughs> um, before before we talk about. The more general things about shooting the film, Roman. Um, I'd, I'd really like to ask you about working with Bertha and uh, how that was for the cinematographer. Hello, sorry, I, I had a bit of an echo. Could you repeat that question? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, um, how was 
before we get into shooting, uh, talking about shooting um, the landscapes and the, and, and the, the amazing images that the film is, uh, is centered on, I, I wondered if you could tell us something about working with uh, and specifically as a lead actor. Um, well, yeah, I, I, th I think, uh, I mean, I, I first met uh, Erfan um, via a photograph that, that Asif showed me. And, and the thing about the photograph was, I think you sort of touched on this a moment ago, was uh, the eyes, uh, the thing that sort of was the overwhelming kind of thing with Asif saying, hey, what do you think of this? And, uh, and, and without meeting him in person, just uh, physically, um, any of the gestures, language, the person, that your fan was or became once I met him, but just just the photograph already pretty much summed up the character in the movie, and also uh, the silence of that photograph pretty much uh, worked in the way that our film was going to work. Insofar as we were going to make a movie that had I don't know, probably correct me if I'm wrong here, as if but we maybe had ten pages of dialogue in the entire movie, uh, and so it was, it was going to be a, a Bresson-esque kind of a movie. Uh, told visually, and uh, and the photograph pretty much told the story. Um, so that was my first impression of, of Irfan, and uh, and then when when I met him and when we worked with him on set, uh, it literally was this charismatic, warm, gentle, um, kingly actor, for want of a better description. He he carried. Uh, weight and gravitas simply by walking into a room and so of course that meant um, whenever you pointed you, you you just needed to point the camera at him and uh, and he he exuded the character that he needed to play and, and exuded the nature of the of the kind of film that it was so for me it was it was it was it was sort of child to play it wasn't sort of oh which way should I get the best out of this character and this this actor should we just should, Shooting from below or above, from profile, it any way which, which way we pointed the camera, he he was the character. Um, yeah. And uh, can I ask you about the the landscapes and how you managed to? I mean, obviously the landscapes are something beautiful in themselves, but there's something about the way that you um, shot the landscapes. I mean, they really are. This gets said a lot about many movies, but I think it's never truer than The Warrior. Um, the landscape is a character in the film, absolutely. Um, so can you tell us something about how you went about creating that effect? We, uh, well, when you were in the desert and we were gonna be in the desert and in the mountains, so that was the sort of the journey. And um, and so initially, Asif and I were kind of discussing the, the movie. We're very inspired both by um, David Lean's uh, Lawrence of Arabia. That was a huge thing. I think I think Asif had this wonderful uh, book um, with uh, amazing photographs, and we put we put seen the movie. I, I personally had also had an impression from uh, the Spartacus um, um, movie, and so we we had. Forefront imperative that the landscape would would, as you say, be a character in the movie. And so for me, it was well, how do we describe the, the desert? How do we describe the mountain? And and my first instinct was we we having both of us been to India and shot and got Gujarat, which was in the desert, um, is to how do we capture the subtleties of light? I the, the first thought is the desert is yellow, the mountain is cool blue. Uh, but then within that, there are such uh, subtleties of tones, and uh, and with that, we we were shooting film at the time, and uh, um, Kodak then did this wonderful uh, stock called Five Two Four Five. It's the, the very finest grain film, which is, has a, a flavour, a, a taste for the warm tones, the earth tones. So that was the perfect film stock for us, and uh, we we took that out there, and uh, and then the other. Uh, technical uh, issue, I suppose, was that we um, we wanted to shoot wide screen, but also wide lenses, so that when you felt when you did a close up of Irfan with the eyes, um, there would still be some context of, of, of tone and texture and, and environment and landscape behind the actor. So the, the, there was always context, and. Um, 
And so, yeah, so, um, but at the same time, that landscape couldn't overwhelm the act and vice versa. So, so it was about shooting on wide lenses, which, which means everything is in focus, but somehow not having the background in focus enough to, um, to undermine the performance in the foreground, the subtle nuances of, of just a look, just a glance, just a, a twitch of the eye, which meant shooting shallow focus. And, um, and this we did by shooting wide open on the, on the aperture and, um, uh, and then having a ridiculous amount of ND filtration on the lens. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit technical here, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, uh, it's bit. fine to be technical. And, and Asif, can I ask you um, about your working relationship with Roman because it was a very, very ambitious project and I think where you were, you didn't have many um, hours of daylight, right? No, no, in the desert. I mean, like, you wake up, the sun's shining until the end of the day. There's not, not a cloud in the sky. When we got to the Himalayas, obviously, um, shooting in the mountains it's you you end up with maybe you start shooting conti continuous days you the sun may only come over the mountain at 11 o'clock and then it's gone by three o'clock and so you have a different process of working also it helped us because getting up and down a mountain itself was a was a thing it wasn't easy to get to the locations um i i think uh sorry what was the beginning of the question Stuart? what was it it was it's about your working relationship with Roman and, and the, the kind of pressures because of the environment you're in and because of the, the limited sort of daylight. So, so what was great about working with Roman and the team uh, was that we had started off when I was a student at the Royal College of Art. We did a, we did a one minute Western initially, which was a, a kind of a, a, a kind of kind of Kodak commercial, which used to be part of being a student, was that you get one roll of film to shoot a film, an advert on. And I wrote a script, uh, which was basically a Western. We shot it in Dungeness and Roman was a cameraman. And that was the first time we worked together. Um, and Victoria was a designer who now is my wife, you know, Victoria. Um, so she was a student at the RCA. And then we did The Sheep Thief, which is again, was the same team. And the team slightly expanded and Dario Marinelli worked with us as a composer and Andy Shelley was a sound designer and some of the tutors who were on that ended up continuing with us onto the Warrior. So the great thing was that we had worked together a few times and had found a process of working and actually we did storyboard. We Good old days when you could lock yourself away and the Warrior experience of, of prepping, still probably for me one of the most beautiful examples of, we're in Udaipur in the mid, it is in the desert, but it's a lake. It's a beautiful lake and we had this room in a hotel, it was out of season, there was no one else around, and we just sat on a rooftop over the lake with notebooks and drew the whole film out. And the storyboards were kind of key. The, the, the film is very designed. Every close-up is in the script. Every insect or detail, you didn't just make it up as we were going along, was all written in the script initially. And then together, Roman and I started off in his flat, normally in, in South London, looking at videos and finding references. And then that continued over to being on location and storyboarding it and there's a photo i've got somewhere of of a particular scene that we were trying to crack and we ended up doing a storyboard in the desert on the sand and um i remember someone took a picture and it was this amazing moment of we're literally drawing out a scene in sand as it's blowing you know and in order to try and crack how are we what, are we crossing the line who knows what it was but it was an interesting kind of thing but it was all prepped and and the finished film I, I'm, there were changes, there were sequences which the editor flipped around or conflated, but a lot of the look and was all planning. It was all in preparation. Would you agree, Roman? Yeah, pretty, pretty much, yeah. Uh, I'm going to throw it over to audience questions in a second. Um, but I just, I just want to ask you something else to see, if, um, because The Warrior was really the, the film that launched Ear fans career right really it sort of um it was he was already an actor but it was the launch pad for him to become what he eventually became which is a fantastic film star in both india hollywood and the uk um but you stayed very close you you, you had a, a great relationship with him and that that, that stayed from the, the yeah i mean he, so you know again it's really hard to go back in time because at the time we were working with a brilliant actor and he wasn't famous and um, he was fantastic and he 
didn't kind of in any way like vanish and you know he was always part of the gang and part of the crew we all ate together we did everything together um he was fantastic at his job but also he was a really good guy offset um and it's odd being someone then becomes a star later on because you know you met in a certain way and often that can happen and you know the people that you work with at the beginning you know they were just some one person that you work with the thing about Irfan I have to say he, he, he had a genuinely beautiful soul and one thing that he always did when he would go on to work with Ang Lee or he'd go on and do Spider-Man movies and Jurassic Park if he's shooting Jurassic Park he'd say look I'm in Hawaii do you want to come and see me or you know uh he would say he'd he'd they won um, Slumdog Millionaire wins the Oscars and he comes out and he's on the red carpet before and after and people will ask him about his experience of winning an Oscar and he will just, at, for no reason, unmotivated, say, but you know, the, I really started out when I did this film called The Warrior and he just had this thing of always mentioning the film and, and it was like, he would always say, that experience changed my life and it was a, you know, when you're far away on the other side of the world and you kind of see your mate who kind of remembers where you started out that's the kind of guy he was in professionally and on a personal level, if I was in India, I'd go and see him with me up. If he was in London or if he was shooting somewhere with me and, you know, he was staying in fancier and fancier hotels, but the guy didn't change. We'd go off and we'd eat. And then, you know, time goes by and you keep thinking you're going to work together. You know, that was always the intention. We were going to make more films together that yeah. he was busy or I never quite wrote the script or I couldn't quite crack something. And then he became ill, you know, I'm leaping forward through time. He came to London, he was having treatment here and I saw him quite a few times. Um, he came to our house, you know, I would meet up in the park or we'd go to a museum or something. I'd just go for a walk or have some food. And again, you know, you're hoping it's going to get better, but we knew by then it was a serious thing. Um, so I, I last saw him in Bombay when I was out there at the end of last year. And I was always intending to go back this year, you know, and then this crazy thing happens to the world and I never, I never got back there. So. It was a kind of interesting, amazing, beautiful kind of journey. Um, and the problem was he lived in Bombay and I lived in London. You don't see that much of each other. But he was the kind of guy who'd ring up in the middle of the night. You know, he would be one of those people who just spontaneously say, I was thinking of you. I had to call you. And it, it's like two in the morning. He's like, what's happened? He goes, nothing. I just wanted to chat. You go, okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> you know, so he was very spontane spontaneous as well. And very, I have to say, open with his like love and friendship in a way when maybe some of us more British types wouldn't have been so cool with saying, you know, uh, you love someone or you're thinking of them or yeah. you, he was one of those guys who was very open with his feelings and his emotions. And he was a good guy. He was a good guy. Hey, hey, uh, Asif, really, I was just um, wondering, uh, Asif, mm -hmm. I was just wondering on that, on that topic, whether uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea to, to read out um, Doug's little, note about his experience I mean, of us. If you've of, got it of, there, yeah. If you've got it I do. Hand, maybe it just, could, it just yeah. I, I thought, I remember when, when Doug wrote that, I just really illustrated in a really concise way, just, just the just sheer Doug was our hand. focus puller, okay? He was from Canada and we met on set. He was absolutely brilliant. So he was a guy whose job was to keep Irfan in focus. And um, if you've got it, so when he died, the, the gang, the crew have all stayed in touch and we have reunions, we meet, you know, it's a really weird thing. It doesn't happen in most movies. Most crew that I've worked with, haven't done that, but there's something about the, the vibe that happened on the warrior, which kind of kept us all in touch. And so go ahead. This is what the focus pillar Doug from Canada said. Yeah. So he, he had been brought in on the, on the project literally at the very last minute, I think like a week before we were about to shoot, we suddenly realized that we needed a, a focus puller because the way that fo the fo focus pulling system works in India is the, the guy who's called a focus puller in India doesn't actually pull uh, he, he pulls focus, but he doesn't go doesn't on with do it any of the other stuff. Run out of time. <laughs> okay, so so um, so he, he comes. He comes. Um, um, so Doug comes completely sort of um, naked from uh, out of nowhere uh, to India, um, and is and he. This is what he wrote: um, the warrior film experience changed me. I did not know anyone on the crew. I showed up after three days travel to Rajasthan, uh, not knowing Roman, Asif, Mark anybody i felt so challenged the first night welcome party on the hot roof i met irfan and he explained india to me he made me feel a friend and he calmed me i knew then i wanted to be do the, my best work uh, for this little film with these strangers in india 
guys. Yeah, Dougie. I mean, that's great. That's great. I'll tell you really, another thing we, that just we, came we, to mind, Stuart, was just, just quickly, was that two things, like one, the film starts in the desert and ends in the mountains. Originally, Irfan's from the desert. Okay, he's from Jaipur. He'd never seen snow before. So when we took him to the mountains, like literally, we've got our character climbing up a hill, and so, and that was his first experience of snow. Secondly, because of the London Film Festival, we brought him to London. He'd never flown out of India before. So when you have these international megastars, you realize at some point he'd never left India. And, and coming to the LFF for the opening when we had it at the film festival and when we had Imagine Asia 20 years ago, that's the first time he'd flown on a plane abroad. You know, so that's kind of where we were coming from. We, we were literally at the beginning of our journeys. Um, and then he goes on to become this amazing thing. But go ahead. Yes. And, and amazingly, I was doing, working at the BFI all those years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I remember doing it with you. Um, should we show that we've got a second clip of earphone and yeah. then we'll we'll have a question or two from the audience. Uh, so can, can we run the clip, please, guys? Okay, I, that, that clip's amazing. I think it's such a sweet clip, and it really shows um, really shows how brilliant the performances are in the film. Um, so we've got some questions from our audience online. Uh, a couple of them I can see that we've um, covered already in our chat. Uh, but there's one here from social media, Asif, which is, um, which film do you enjoy the most? Uh, which Irfan Khan film do you enjoy the most, which is not The Warrior? So, so which performance do you th is your favourite of his? I did like The Lunchbox a lot. I thought that was a really beautiful film. Um, uh, I suppose that's the one I would go to. I think um, some of the Miranair work as well, namesake. Um, he obviously end up, ended up doing lots of big studio films, but it wouldn't normally be the kind of films I'd watch. But the thing about Irfan is consistently, no matter the movie, he will be the best thing in it. So there's a lot of films that I wouldn't normally watch. And then there'd be this one scene where he turns up and you're like, I believe that scene, you know, because he's in it and he's doing something which is like on another level. Um, but I suppose those were the ones that I'd say, you know, the kind of, they're both, I guess, a bit like The Warrior. They're the sort of crossing between India and the US. They're mixing kind of European, or, sorry, Indian and world cinema. Uh, and we've got one more, which is, um, where can we see The Sheep Thief? Is there a place that people can go and, and see the sheep thief anywhere? Where are they based? It depends. I mean, it's actually on the BFI website, available for free. So it's on the BFI player if you're in the UK. Um, I know the DVD of The Warrior used to have it as an extra, but somehow Film 4 may have knocked it out of sync, whoever that tech person is at Film 4. Uh, yeah, not, so not so it depends on where they are. But I know, and probably, you know, I wouldn't normally say this, it's probably somewhere on YouTube. Okay, well, but the best version of it, a remastered version, is on a BFI player. This is a, this is a very good place to end our conversation. <laughs> uh, very much on brand, so please do go to BFI player. I said at the beginning, The Warrior is available on BFI player. Uh, it will be there for quite some time, so please do go and see it. Um, whether or not you've seen it before, go and see it again. Um, one more message from me, a sort of parish notice from BFI. Uh, we are a charity, uh, the same as all businesses in lockdown. We uh, we have no revenues. Get Irfan in. There's Irfan. 
we're providing these programs uh, for free to our audiences so if you could donate to the BFI please do the messages should be on our YouTube page and please also look for our, look at our social media um, for all of our other online events that are coming up we've got an amazing program coming up in the next a uh, couple of months, we've got a huge Japan collection, which you can go on and enjoy now. Um, we have uh, an amazing film made by Mark Cousins, which is a real epic looking at uh, all of the achievements of women filmmakers, many of whom perhaps the ones that you don't know about. Um, and uh, what else do we got? Uh, yeah, lots and lots more coming. Uh, so please do keep an eye on the social media. And now it comes to me to thank Asif Kapadia and Roman Osin. And thank everyone for joining in and to say goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank Have a Just great weekend. It.